Hi everyone. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium and it's just me today, um, but I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking all about the Aurora. Um, so we're going to look at some of the mythology behind it, uh, what exactly causes it, and then at the end give you some tips and tricks to help you um, see it yourself, especially for those that are up here in Minnesota. Um, now, I will be checking comments, so if you have any questions throughout the stream, just write them in the comments, um, and I will be checking those periodically, and um, anything I don't get to, I will take a few minutes at the end of the stream to make sure I get to any questions that were missed. Um, and just another reminder that there is a bit of a delay between when um, I answer a question and when you hear the answer, and so just give it a few minutes, but again, I will try and get to all of the questions at the end for anything I missed. All right, so I'm going to switch it over to our presentation. And so we are going to be talking about the aurora, the northern lights. Um, now these generally appear as these glowing dancing curtains in the sky. Um, but what you may not realize is the aurora are actually and kind of oval shaped glow that is around the two poles of the earth. Um, and so there is one around the North Pole, which we call the Aurora Borealis. And there's one around the South Pole, which is the Aurora Australis. Um, now these kind of ovals of Aurora can vary in size, which is why it can kind of change where and when we can see the Aurora. Um, and we'll get into why it changes in just a little bit. So the name Aurora Borealis is actually Greek. Um, the word Aurora is derived from the um, Greek and Roman goddess of the dawn. And so you can think of the dawn as kind of like the bringer of light. And then um, Borealis comes from the word Boreas, which means wind. And so the kind of aurora boreas is the kind of northern wind that brings the light. And then once uh, we knew there is a similar thing in the south, around the southern pole, um, we switch it up a little bit to aurora australis to be the southern wind that brings the light. But there are a lot of cultures that have stories about the aurora. Um, one of my favorites comes from Finland. It's a Finnish story. Um, and it tells the story of the fire fox. And so here's a short little clip from um, an animated short that I think is adorable. Um, but the, the Finnish folklore says that the aurora is um, a fire fox who is running so quickly across the sky that its tail is creating sparks. And it's those glowing sparks that we see as the aurora. Uh, now, I'm only showing a small portion of this clip because I don't want to get in trouble with YouTube. Um, but I have put the link for the full animated short down in the video description. And I highly encourage going to check it out because it's really cute. Uh, one of my other favorites comes from China where they described the Aurora as this big celestial battle between good and evil dragons. Um, and then the Inuit saw the Aurora as the spirits of the dead who were playing a game of ball using a waller skull. And so the dancing lights are the people kind of running back and forth, kicking the ball around, playing this game. All right, so that's a little bit about the aurora and the mythology, but let's get into what exactly is causing this. And to understand where the aurora comes from, we first have to start off at the sun, because the sun is ultimately the source of our aurora. And so what you may or may not know is there is this thing that we call a solar wind. It's the stream of charged particles that's constantly flowing out and away from the sun out in all directions. And so these charged particles, the solar wind, is constantly moving out away from the sun through space. And then every so often the sun will also have these little bursts 
Um, some of these come from solar flares, which can look like this, where we have these arches of gas that end up stretching too far and then they snap. Um, kind of like stretching rubber bands too much. And so when it snaps, it flings that gas out into space. And so you get a little bit extra stuff flung out. Um, or even bigger than this could be what we call a coronal mass ejection, which is another, it's, it's just a really big solar flare um, is kind of the simplest way to think of it. And so between the solar wind and the solar flares, we have a lot of charged particles constantly streaming away from the sun and heading towards us. Well, for the most part, this stream of charged particles, the solar wind and the things from the flares and the CMEs, the coronal mass ejections, don't really bother us because the Earth is essentially like a big magnet. And so it has a magnetic field that surrounds it. Um, and so what we're seeing here on the right is a typical bar magnet um, that is encased in um, this box that has this uh, fluid with a bunch of iron filings um, mixed in with it. And you can see the iron filings kind of creating these loops around the magnet. And what they're doing are lining up around the magnetic fields that's created by this magnet. And so it allows us to kind of visualize that. Well, the Earth acts exactly the same way. We are a giant magnet. And so we have these loops of magnetic field that are coming out and surround the Earth. And so when this stream of charged particles heads out and away from the sun and towards the earth, our magnetic field acts like a big shield. It um, protects us from most of those charged particles. Instead, the solar wind and other charged particles get just deflected away from the earth because of this magnetic field acting as the shield. But not all of them do. Uh, you may be hearing my cat in the background. She has decided that she wants attention during the stream. Um, but so not all of these charged particles get deflected away. Some of them do get caught in the magnetic field, just like the iron filings we saw. And when they get caught in the magnetic field, they follow the magnetic field down to the Earth, where they then hit the Earth's atmosphere. And that's why our aurora are always around the poles, because that's where the magnetic field lines are generated. That's where they're coming from. And so when those charged particles follow those lines down to the Earth, they're being directed toward either the North or the South Pole. And so they hit the atmosphere. Now, <laughs> when they hit the atmosphere, what they're doing are hitting the different gases in the atmosphere. And when a charged particle hits an atom of gas, it gives that atom of gas some energy and it causes it to become excited. Well, atoms don't like being excited. They don't like having extra energy. And so what they do is they give off that extra energy to come back down to kind of a normal level. And the way they give off or get rid of this excess energy is by emitting light but they emit light of a specific color. And so in the upper atmosphere, we have a bunch of oxygen, which gives off a red glow when it kind of de-excites. Um, a little bit further down, that oxygen is a little bit more denser, a little bit more concentrated. Um, and that kind of subdues the red glow, and instead what we see is a green glow coming from the oxygen. And then even further down, um, we have a bunch of uh, nitrogen. And the nitrogen gives off red and blue, but the blue tends to be brighter. And so those are the three dominant colors that we see coming from the aurora. The high up red is from oxygen, the green is also from oxygen, and the kind of bluish purple that we see kind of at the bottom is from nitrogen. 
Um, and so what you're seeing on the right here is a really good clip of the aurora taken from the International Space Station. And you can really see those layers of colors, the red and the green. And you can also really see how this is generated kind of higher up in the atmosphere, almost this like layer that we're seeing. And that's where the charged particles are hitting the atmosphere there. Now, back to the idea of this kind of auroral or aurora kind of oval or circle. Um, how big that is and how far down it extends depends on how much of those charged particles are falling down onto the Earth and hitting the atmosphere. So when we have a typically kind of quiet sun, um, where we have just the typical solar wind, um, there's not going to be a whole lot coming down. Uh, and so the aurora ovals tend to be a bit smaller and concentrated a bit closer to the poles. But when we have a big flare or a CME, a coronal mass ejection, we get a lot more stuff that's heading our way or could be heading our way. And that causes the aurora to be bigger and stronger and um, that auroral zone becomes wider and stretches kind of further down from the poles. And so that's where kind of all of that um, comes from. Now, believe it or not, the Earth is actually not the only planet to have auroras. Um, as we can see here, Jupiter and Saturn also have auroras around their north and south pole, and they're caused exactly the same way. They have a magnetic field, and so charged particles from the sun um, spiral down that magnetic field, and hit the atmosphere, causing it to glow. Um, one of the big differences, though, is Jupiter's and Saturn's magnetic fields are much, much stronger than Earth's. And so these auroras tend to be bigger and brighter, and they actually glow brightest in the ultraviolet. Um, and so what you're seeing here are actually composite images of a um, visual light image of the planet, and then superimposed on that is a UV image of the aurora. Now, Uranus and Neptune, <laughs> hi, Quinn. Uranus and Neptune also have auroras, but theirs are a little bit different. You can see here with Uranus's that instead of being that oval shape, that we see with Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. It's more of a couple points of light. Um, and while we think Uranus and Neptune's auroras are caused from the same thing, the same uh, mechanism as Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, um, the magnetic field itself is a little strange. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about this, though, because studying these two planets from Earth is very difficult just because of how far away they are. And we've only had one spacecraft that has flown past them to give us up-close data, and that was Voyager 2 back in the 1980s. And so um, the auroras and the planets in general of Uranus and Neptune are still, there's still a lot of mysteries there. Um, oops, before moving on, um, two other planets also have auroras, Mars and Venus, but these are very different because neither of these planets has a magnetic field. Um, so it, it's a different type of mechanism, a different type of aurora that causes them, but they have them as well. All right, so we know what causes the aurora now. So how do we go about seeing it for ourselves? And for those of you here in Minnesota, um, we have a much higher chance of actually seeing them than anyone kind of further south. Um, and so there are a lot of different places that you can go to to look at forecasts for the aurora. And I'm just going to hop out of my slides for just a second. Um, so I have links to all of these sites down in the description of the video. But one of the places that you can go is spaceweather.com. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Um, space weather is the name we give for things like solar flares and CMEs and any sort of storms coming from the sun. Um, and so what 
spaceweather.com does is it gives you a active image of the sun today and then a little bit further down it shows you what that auroral, auroral that's a difficult word to say what that auroral oval looks like and gives you kind of predictions for how likely it is to see an aurora. Uh, now, another similar site that does this is the Space Weather Prediction Center by NOAA, and they do the same thing. They give current images of the sun, and then they give current um, aurora, auroral <laughs> maps um, to give um, estimates of kind of where's a good place to, to see them. Um, and a little bit more uh, central to us here in Duluth, um, some of you may know of Bob King, also known as Astro Bob. He has an astronomy blog that he posts on, I want to say daily, and he's really good about when there is a good chance of seeing the aurora here in the Duluth area of posting an article letting you know. Um, so this is another source of um, some good kind of up-to-date news for this. But back to the slides real quick. Um, when looking at these predictions for um, where the aurora is going to be or how strong it's going to be, one of the things you're going to notice is something down here that's uh, called it the KP index or the K index. And that's just a scale that we use for how active the sun is and how strong or likely an aurora is going to be. So for us to have even a slight chance of seeing it from here in Duluth, we need a KP index of at least four. And higher, of course, would be even better. Um, and so that's kind of your, your quick scale of how likely is it going to be for us to see it. Um, now, another source that you can use is actually a phone app, which again, I have links in the comment or in the video description. Um, the staff, Planetarium staff's favorite app to use is the Aurora app, um, Aurora Forecast. I have, again, links to it. Um, and this uses your GPS location to give you up-to-date predictions on Aurora activity. And so it tells you your KP index, um, your viewing probability, it shows you where that aurora oval is, and you can even set it up to send you alerts when the KP index um, rises, to send you alerts of, hey, you have a good chance of seeing an aurora in the next half hour if you go outside. Um, and so this is a really, really great app to use. All right, so that's how you can get kind of an aurora forecast and know when is a good time to go out. And it's kind of important, um, a, a common misconception a lot of people have is that you can only see auroras during the winter. That's because a lot of the pictures tend to come from near the poles where they have a lot of snow for most of the year. Um, but that's not the case. You could see an aurora any time in the year. Um, and these kind of forecasts can tell you that for every day throughout the year, what our chances are of seeing it. So um, there are some good spots um, in Minnesota to check out the aurora. Um, near Duluth, um, you can see the aurora even from um, as close as Brighton Beach. One of my staff um, actually has pictures that she has taken of the aurora from Brighton Beach. You can see those um, in the planetarium. Um, now, if you want to travel a little bit further away from Duluth, um, anywhere in Cook County, especially up in like Grand Marais and Grand Portage or up the Gunflint Trail are always going to be really good spaces because you're getting a bit further north and away from city lights. Um, Voyagers National Park, another good place, again, kind of northern, remote, away from city lights. Um, but when we have strong activity, you can actually see them down from the Twin Cities. So for anyone further south in Minnesota, um, for a strong aurora, you could see them there if you're able to just get out of the main downtown area away from the bulk of the city lights. Um, so there's a lot of good places here. Um, unfortunately for anyone viewing outside of Minnesota, especially further south, um, you're 
less likely to see them, you're definitely going to need to actually travel further north um, to see them. So we have our spots, we have our viewing spots, we have our aurora predictions. And so let's say the aurora happens, we know it's happening, we have a good chance, KP index is high, we head out to our viewing site, what is it going to look like? Well, the first thing to know is a lot of the pictures that we see have the aurora being very bright, um, very colorful, way overhead. And by eye and for us, that's not how it's actually going to look. Um, a lot of these pictures are, again, taken much, much further north where the aurora is really bright overhead. But for us, unless we're having a very high KP index, a very strong aurora, there's actually going to be a much milder glow closer to the horizon. And it may not be very colorful. A lot of the pictures that we see of the aurora are through cameras whose um, CCDs, whose sensors, are um, more sensitive than our eyes. And so they pick up on those colors more so than our eyes will. And so you're actually more likely to see a more mild, even grayish glow um, that you may not even recognize at first as an aurora. Um, because unless you have something like these pillars of light, sometimes it can look just like light clouds on the horizon. Um, and so this is uh, kind of important because a lot of people expect when they go out to see what they see in pictures, those really bright, colorful displays of light. Um, but that's not necessarily going to happen um, because, again, our eyes have a different sensitivity than cameras and all of that. But that is all about the Aurora. So let me switch back over to my camera. Um, and so hopefully uh, you now know a little bit more about this, um, how it's formed, and ways to kind of check it out for yourself. Um, if you have any questions, now's a good time to put them down in the comments um, so that I can answer any questions you have. And while we wait for that, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's coming up uh, next week. So Wednesday, we're going to have another edition of Constellation Storytime, where we'll go through kind of the stars and constellations that you can see up um, during the month of May and some of the stories behind them. And then on Saturday, we are doing a show all about telescopes. Um, and so we're going to kind of give you a beginner's guide to buying and using telescopes. And so tell you kind of our recommendations for some good beginner's telescopes, some sources where you could get them, and then give you some tips for using the scope and um, some good kind of objects to kind of look at during the summer um, that are easy to find and kind of good beginner objects. Um, so do we have any questions come in? No? All right. Well, Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, as always, if you want to watch this again or um, any shows that you may have missed, they're all up on our YouTube channel, which is linked in the description. Um, so yeah, have a great weekend. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye.